And we are live. Um, welcome to uh, the Worldwide Neuro Theory Forum uh, at worldwideneuro.com. Uh, my name is Tim Vogels. I am currently still an associate professor at the University of Oxford, but soon moving to Austria. And I have with me today Moritz Helmstetter, who's um, the director of the Max Planck Institute in Frankfurt. Uh, before I introduce Moritz, uh, I just wanted to let you know as or remind you that there is a chat uh, function on the right-hand side of your screen that you should um, use at your leisure to ask questions um, and voice your enthusiasm about Moritz's work. Moritz won't be able to see that during his talk because he will only see his own presentation, but I can uh, ask questions for you. Uh, for more complex questions or if you want to come on screen after your uh, after Moritz's talk, uh, you can also put your question in the Ask a Question box in the bottom. Um, and then uh, I would like to remind you to follow us on Twitter or subscribe to the uh, email list uh, to get weekly updates of our talk schedule. We have another 118 talks scheduled uh, right now on Worldwide Neuro until the rest of the year, and there's more coming, so stay tuned for more science excitement in these weird times. Um, with that, I'll quickly uh, tell you about Moritz. Uh, he was a grad student with Bert Sackman in Heidelberg after he studied physics and medicine there, um, and then went on to do a postdoc with Winfried Denk and stuck with the techniques that he uh, uh, picked up in Winfried's lab uh, working on the connectome when he got his first group leader position at the Max Planck Institute in Munich. Uh, and soon after, three years after that, uh, he moved to become the director of the Max Planck Institute in Frankfurt, uh, where he still is. He's been there for six years now, um, and he's produced some beautiful work, uh, most notably a, a science paper uh, last year, at the end of last year, that described um, beautifully the architecture of a piece of cortex and that I read with much enthusiasm because I thought we might be able to uh, pick some of that architecture up and put it into models and that's why Moritz is here today to tell us more about that and for us to pick his brain uh, with you know the possibility in mind uh, to model some of this stuff. So thanks for uh, coming to a theory seminar Moritz. I'll uh, give the screen to you. Please share your a screen and then share your work. Thank you very much for being here. Um, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Great pleasure to be here. Let me share my screen. Okay, so I'm assuming you can see my presentation, Tim. If that's not the case, please interfere. Yeah, I can. Okay, perfect. So again, welcome. Thanks a lot for... Yes, I'm assuming you can... Thanks a lot for your interest in um, our work. Um, obviously, in these crazy right. times. There is a little uh, bar at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you just have to hit hide on that. Sorry for interrupting. Oh, now it killed your entire. That did not have the desired effect. What about this? <laughs> yeah, perfect. OK, good. Again. So yeah, in these crazy times um, with online presentations, uh, Great pity for me not to be able to see you. Um, uh, I'm really speaking to my laptop screen, but I'll try to make it uh, uh, exciting instead. Uh, in spite of that, um, and I'm looking forward to discussing with you. So, uh, as Tim said, I think there is a chat option, and that will allow you to interfere immediately uh, with questions if anything is unclear. So please use it, and I'll be most happy to discuss because uh, I'd be hoping for this to be a little bit of an interactive situation and not, again, just me talking to a screen. All right, so um, I want to talk about what we call connectomics, which is uh, the goal of looking at the brain from the point of view of its neuronal networks. And in particular, I'm interested in the cerebral cortex, which we all know and, and love and uh, cherish uh, and make use of every day, obviously, for all of our science, um, because it houses those extremely interesting um, networks that give rise to what we consider cognitive function, that give, gives rise to the possibility to, to detect, to predict, to hypothesize, to, um, you know, call out as wrong or right 
and all these interesting things. Now, as you know, we have many nerve cells, about 16 billion in the cortex, in the cerebral cortex, which is a large number. Mice have about a thousand times less, but still a large number. And um, structurally, these uh, about 16 billion nerve cells give rise to a very densely packed tissue setup in which if you pick even a cubic millimeter, so a small piece of brain, then you'll find uh, about 50 to 100,000 nerve cells in there with their cell bodies and then another 10 kilometers of axons and about a billion synapses. And this is really um, a structural reality, so to say that I think it's very important to embrace and not forget about um, that even in such a small piece of, of tissue, we have that amount of uh, complexity. And as you know, the reason for that is that the interaction networks of the brain in terms of the neurons that talk to each other, um, these networks are of a complexity that's I think not matched by any other interaction network implemented by cables. And the result of such a cable-based complex network implementation is um, again, what you're seeing here in terms of numbers, kilometers of axons packed into even the smallest piece of brain. The networks that are created by that level of uh, physical um, uh, detail and physical complexity are um, of the order of about 1,000. And this is really the number that I consider most important about uh, our brains or about mammalian brains as far as we know, at least today, um, that at least in the cerebral cortex, nerve cells typically communicate with about 1,000 other nerve cells. So the, again, degree of interaction is about 1,000. This is an order of magnitude statement. It's not precise to the, to the digit here. Um, some, for some neurons, it may be more several hundreds, from some it may be several thousands, but it's on that scale. And again, finding any other interaction network um, in which the average um, actor, so to say, the average node has 1,000 interaction um, edges or degrees. Um, this is really rare, even if you compare it to your online friendship. Now, um, this is not to say, obviously, that the brain is, is a static phenomenon, of course not. So the reason I'm speaking so much about these networks and the structure of these networks is because I think it's fair to say that we know so much more about the dynamics of nerve cells, the dynamics of synapses um, and their beautiful um, temporal um, activity ranges and activity scales, their plasticity, their um, ability to change um, on scales of time scales of milliseconds, seconds, minutes, or hours and years. And um, there is a lot of knowledge about that, but when you put that together with the current state of knowledge about the network structure, then I think it's fair to say again, that we know much less still about the um, particular structures that the brain networks, so to say, the neural networks in our head um, uh, constitute. So um, this is what I'm going to be talking about most of the time today, and I'll try to share our recent uh, progress and also the ways that we're trying to make sense of the data that we're acquiring. Now, you may ask first, uh, why is it uh, such a big problem to measure networks uh, in the brain? The reason is very simple. The reason is that nerve cells are very complex and make use of spatial dimensions in a very peculiar way, which is they um, extend very thin cables of 50 to 100 nanometer diameter um, over very large distances on that scale. So very large meaning millimeters to centimeters in the case of the mouse and definitely centimeters in the case of the human, um, reminding ourselves that many of the pyramidal cells in our cortex uh, extend their axons to the other part of the brain, the other side of the brain even. Um, so these are microscopically large distances um, and these are again traveled, so to say, or covered by these very thin cables and this is happening in 3D. And uh, if, if you put all of that together, it becomes clear that if you want to image this kind of network structure, um, you need to have reasonably high resolution of imaging that allows you to resolve cables as thin as 50 to 100 nanometers, but over very large distances, so large scales in three dimensions. And this altogether has made it quite a challenge uh, over the last 100 years uh, roundabout to uh, 
go from seeing a single cell to seeing all cells in a piece of tissue. And this is what we're talking about um, in our field. This notion of dense packing is really something that we have to uh, embrace. And uh, one point I want to make before going into the work that, that we are doing is that um, if you use light microscopy, you can see beautiful structures of nerve cells and you can also get the impression of density, of high density, but you're only going to be looking at um, a very tiny fraction of the nerve cells present in a piece of tissue. What I mean by that is illustrated here on the, on the left. So in essence, you can say whenever you can see nerve cells with your eye in a, in a, a preparation like the ones shown there, be, be it fills of, of pairs of neurons or so, or the beautiful drawings by Cajal, um, or viral-based labelings in which you can still disentangle the, um, the particular nerve cells. Whenever you can do that, then by virtue of the packing density of the underlying brain tissue, you're only looking at about one in every few thousand to one in every few tens of thousands of neurons. So you're sampling of the neurons present of the tissue um, packing is only 10 to the minus four roughly. And that is really important to realize. So even when it looks dense, it's a very minute fraction of the neurons present. And that's why we have to use other techniques and we're currently uh, in the field uh, using electron microscopy. About 15, um, 20 years ago now, uh, the usage of electron microscopy, which of course is much older than that, uh, turned into um, an attempt to automate uh, some parts of electron microscopy um, to acquire data sets at scale at the proper resolution and the proper scale um, that I was talking about before. And the first um, technique that was developed in this new era, if you want, of electron microscopy was the one developed by Winfried Denk in Heidelberg at the time, um, which is shown in the bottom left, uh, which had the key innovation to combine the imaging of a block of tissue, the surface of the block, with knife-based, diamond knife-based cutting or more precisely abrasion of the top of the tissue block after an image was taken. And this uh, automation of the acquisition and uh, the placement of, of all the necessary equipment within the vacuum chamber of the electron microscope um, allowed an automation uh, and, and also throughput and uh, uh, also stability that for the first time then allowed to go over large distances, not just in 2D, but in 3D. So really uh, unlocking, if you want, uh, the third dimension to the point of having really long uh, series of sections um, taken uh, within a reasonable amount of time to cover reasonable distances uh, for tissue analysis. Now, um, there are roughly four main approaches uh, currently uh, in the field about how to acquire large-scale high-resolution data, and all of them are still being heavily pursued and have their uh, pros and cons, so to say. And I just want to briefly mention them for um, context so that in case you're interested, you can uh, follow up uh, on that in more detail. So the one approach is uh, using the um, transmission electron microscope where you shoot electrons through the very thin tissue sections and automating and uh, accelerating the imaging part of the transmission electron microscopy part of this method. Um, by using larger camera arrays and, and other tricks or even, even more efficient detection. And this is then combined with some sort of sectioning, initially still manual, but increasingly automated approaches to, to sectioning. And these are approaches that are um, successfully uh, used right now, for instance, by the Allen Brain Institute and other places. And then there was a major innovation in terms of automated tissue sectioning and tissue collection section collection um, provided uh, by or contributed by Ken Hayworth uh, while he was in the lab of Jeff Lichtman, um, where he um, developed a machine, so to say, that, that creates a conveyor belt-like mechanism to collect other thin sections after they have been cut off a tissue block and place them on, a, in that case, electron intransparent tape uh, on which they will be automatically collected and then um, can be used for electron microscopic imaging later. Um, and this is something I'll briefly talk about at the end of my presentation as well. And then just to uh, make the picture complete, there is an approach in which 
um, you use block phase imaging. So you image your tissue block from the top, like I described for the serial block phase EM um, approach uh, that Winfried Denk had developed. But instead of using a knife, you use a focused iron beam to um, ablate your top layer of tissue after imaging. So again, imaging, and then you want to get rid of the tissue you've just imaged. And um, here in that approach, the focused iron beam milling approach, you would do that using a focused uh, gallium iron beam rather than a knife. And this is an approach that is especially fruitful if you want to go to very high resolution, so more on the scale of several nanometers in X, Y, and Z, um, isotropic high resolution imaging. Um, and that's an approach pursued and developed and uh, pushed forward by especially the Genia Farm um, campus and uh, with uh, the goal of imaging the fly brain. All right, with that much methodological introduction about the imaging, I will not talk about our early work, which was in the retina, mammalian retina, mouse retina, where we um, used these techniques early on to map completely large uh, sets of neurons on the scale of a thousand nerve cells and all of their interactions. But I will now jump to our more recent work on cortex, which I introduced already a little bit and will focus on explaining how and to what end we been acquiring that kind of data and analyzing it. Um, just for uh, you know, moving images, this is a reminder of the imaging method that I introduced here, block phase EM developed by Winfried Denk, um, imaging of the tissue block from the top with an electron beam that of course is not yellow as shown here, but uh, yeah, you know what I mean. And uh, then uh, after you take the image, you operate your, or operate, uh, and take off your top tissue section using an oscillating diamond knot. Using that approach, we acquired um, uh, tissue from various cortices. I will first talk about S1 cortex, primary somatosensory cortex of mouse. Um, uh, in particular, a piece of uh, tissue acquired from layer four of primary somatosensory cortex of mouse. As many of you know, um, in that part of cortex, we find what is called cortical columns, at least presumed modules of cortical computation because the whiskers on the snouts of the animal are mapped onto units of about 10,000 nerve cells that uh, mainly represent the input from one of these uh, whiskers. And what you're seeing here now is the original EM data that we acquired from layer four, the main thalamocortical recipient layer in cortex. Um, and what you can see here at high resolution is uh, the beauty, I think, of brain tissue, so larger dendrites uh, running through. You're also seeing those black and sheath processes. These are myelinated axons, so high speed if you want transmission axons. Um, and then there is a cell body coming in from the right right now. But you're also uh, hopefully able to see uh, at least some of the beautiful synapses and very thin cables. There's a cable bundle, for instance, right now running between the two cell bodies here, or yeah, there are synapses here and there. I'm not sure about the um, you know, quality of the transmission here online right now for the movie, but uh, I'm assuming or hoping you were able to appreciate some of this uh, beautiful uh, complexity uh, of brain tissue that I talked about in numbers, in terms of numbers before. Now, the goal was to reconstruct each and every detail in that piece of tissue to get really a dense mapping of all the uh, neuronal, at least, processes and their synapses and the interaction. For that, we first had to identify more larger structures like um, blood vessels and cell bodies, um, and then used um, a processing pipeline that essentially relies on um, convolutional neural nets, so nowadays called AI for image processing, um, to pre-process our data followed by uh, volume segmentation steps that then, and this uh, was um, key here, uh, are used to identify locations of uh, uncertainty in the automated analysis that could then be re-inspected or validated in an efficient way by human annotators. And this combination of mostly AI-based but partly still human uh, proofread annotation is what allowed us to go for um, the reconstructions. And what you're seeing here is um, are all the neurons that had a cell body in this piece of tissue this actually was uh, automatically reconstructed. So here there were really minimal uh, corrections, but uh, essentially this is an automated, fully automated reconstruction um, of those proximal dendrites, as we would say, of the nerve cells in that piece of tissue, a total of 
about 100 that when superimposed look already extremely dense. So what you're now seeing on the left of the screen is the superposition of um, all of those uh, 89 nerve cells um, present in that tissue with their cell body. And it essentially already looks pretty uh, dense and pretty packed, but quantitatively, this constitutes only about 3% of the cable length packed into that piece of tissue. In other words, there's still so much more to reconstruct. In particular, axons, which make up more than half of the cable length in that piece of tissue, dendritic shafts of dendrites coming in from uh, the outside, but then also not to forget the spine necks, so the connection wires, so to say, between um, the main site of excitatory synaptic transmission in cortex and the dendrites that they're linked to. And these are, in terms of reconstruction, actually, um, quite some uh, challenging structures because spine necks are really thin. They can even be as thin as 30 nanometers or so in cortex, uh, at least in mouse. Now, uh, I briefly uh, said already we developed a pipeline how to essentially detect uh, where the automated methods may have made an error and then use some efficient uh, polling of human annotation um, uh, to solve these errors. And we made use here of an interaction with this kind of three-dimensional uh, image data in which the user is flying through it. So it's essentially a 3D flight steering uh, approach, which is in our hands uh, the most efficient way of asking humans to interact with this kind of data at difficult locations and then get very efficient feedback uh, in terms of uh, work hours invested. All of that together allowed us to also reconstruct those um, uh, majority of cables in here, which are the axons. And this amounted to close to two meters of axonal wires, axonal um, processes um, with, again, a work hour investment that was substantially faster than what we had done before. And uh, with that, we were able to now look at the dense structure of that kind of tissue. So this uh, was a methodological uh, advance also in terms of uh, effectiveness, so to say, of reconstruction that obviously we will, uh, we are uh, pushing further forward. Well, um, and uh, now what uh, is the main result of that? So is there a question already? Uh, yeah, I was just gonna ask before you said that Without the axons, it was 3% of the overall volume that you analyzed. And when you include the axons, what, like, what's the percentage of the volume uh, of tissue that you've... That yeah, you've... so to be more precise, uh, the fraction that I was reporting was a fraction of path length. So uh, in terms of volume, actually, the, the cells, obviously the large cell bodies and their large dendrites and so on make up quite some volume. But the problem is, we, for us, what, what is essentially the... the um, most relevant measure is path length because thin processes are even more difficult and contribute most of the path length. So um, these axons, I think, are around about 60 or 65 percent of path length, and then all the spine necks, another 20 percent, dendrites, um, 15 percent on that scale. So we've re reconstructed all of it. I was focusing, uh, focusing on the axons because these required most care in terms of um, improving the automated methods, but dendrites. Um, were automatically reconstructed and um, spine heads were automatically detected and to a large fraction connected automatically to the dendrite, but there was some remaining manual intervention also with the spine attachment. So to answer your question, in the end, essentially everything was reconstructed that was neuronal, um, but uh, the, the most difficult part um, are the densely uh, placed axons. So. The per, the numbers you just named is basically ninety three percent of the path length, um, sixty five plus twenty plus three, right? Yeah, um, yeah but then that that only means that I I mean I put them out of my head, so they obviously they will add up to one hundred. Yeah. Okay. So the rest is still neuronal. It's not. Um, well, okay. Again, to be clear, so if you were reporting volume fractions, then you would have to account for glia, extracellular space and a space uh, covered by uh, blood vessels and importantly also the uh, surrounding uh, cells that surround the blood vessels. So I was not talking about that. So at these numbers I don't have off my head, I would have to look it up. Um, uh, roughly uh, in this kind of tissue we have 5% extracellular space with another 15% glial volume fraction and then the rest is uh, neuronal. But uh, I was talking about the path length fraction. Well, great, thank you. Other questions? Nope, none so far. Okay, then I'll um, 
switch over to what was uh, in a way our one of our key goals of this kind of project to um, map what you can see here, which we would call a connectome. So this is now a, a matrix reporting for all the uh, about 7,000 axons and all the about three and a half, 3.7 thousand um, postsynaptic structures, mostly dendrites, but also cell bodies. Um, the number of synapses, of chemical synapses established between them. And again, this is in, in our words, we, we call it a local high resolution connectome. Um, you could also call it an adjacency matrix that describes a graph. So that's obviously for those working on, on these kinds of methods like Tim introduced, um, that's the obvious uh, way of looking at that. So this is essentially reporting again, how many synapses are made between any pair of pre and post synaptic structures in that piece of tissue. And um, there's much more information than the one shown here. So here we're essentially only reporting the number of synapses made. I'll talk about other aspects of synapses that are very interesting, but this is um, uh, one key way of, of uh, displaying this kind of data. Okay, so for the... Uh, very quickly, the volume you analyzed was what? Someone just asked and I... Yeah, so this is, uh, so it's half a million cubic microns. Um, so uh, about 60 by 90 by, again, I have to have the number of my head, 70 something micrometers on the side. So ha essentially half of what 100 micron cubic would be. So five, 500,000 cubic micrometers densely reconstructed. And uh, do you have in your connectivity matrix, I suppose you're going to talk about it. Maybe I'll let you talk. Um, any axons that are coming from neurons that are in your volume? Yes. So this um, obviously is a minority, uh, given the size of the nerve cells. Um, any nerve cell where you have the the soma takes some time to you know develop the axon, and then often they dip down. So so you're losing many of those. But yes, we have some. So is, I mean, nominally speaking, we have 89 nerve cells and and all their local output there. And of those, a uh, fraction has a little bit larger axons. But this is clearly um, something I'll talk about uh, at the end, that we're, of course, um, pushing heavily to get much larger volumes in which we will have uh, uh, many nerve cells with all of the axons reconstructed. Here, we made use of the fact that we have the dense reconstruction with all axons anywhere coming, coming from anywhere, um, and really asking this local fabric of nerve tissue, this local dense web of, of fibers and, and wires and synapses, can we make sense of it in that on that local scale? Thank you. All right. Um, so the first question I'll uh, ask, and I'll try to maybe go a little faster right now, um, in terms of analysis. So how, how are we um, using this kind of data to ask a question? So the first question we had is, as many of you know, um, there is enormous amounts of uh, literature about how to classify nerve cells. How to say this is obviously a pyramidal cell, an excitatory cell that's a little less controversial, but then there is this beautiful population of about 20% of the nerve cells in mammalian brains that are called inhibitory interneurons because they're releasing GABA and doing something that, uh, by the way, uh, in current AI isn't really made use of the fact that you have negative signs of the say transmission, you have an, uh, inhibition and uh, that is a zoo of nerve cell types that uh, we wanted to ask, is it possible to pull out from the connectome without any further information? So essentially using only connectivity to pull out the likely um, cell types of inhibitory axons. And um, we tested that by looking at all the many thousand axons that we had and asking whether their target preference, so the amount of synaptic connectivity they establish with certain types, if you want, or parts of postsynaptic neurons, in particular cell bodies, apical dendrites, axon initial segments, um, whether the signature of this innovation alone would statistically pull out the, the cell types present in the tissue. And just to get an idea of how uh, we did that, uh, very simply, we simply ask is the average uh, innervation of a given uh, postsynaptic structure reflected in the distribution of uh, preferences over many thousands of axons. 
And on the right side, you can see the result of these analyses essentially is asking what is the expected distribution of preference for a certain target to be innovated compared with the actual data, which is shown in black uh, here. And um, so we were then able to determine for which kinds of postsynaptic target structures there were any and also how many um, axons that would over frequently in that statistical sense innovate these postsynaptic structures. And by doing so, we were able to pull out um, preference for somata, so cell body innovation, proximal dendrites, apical dendrites, also smooth dendrites, so dendrites of interneurons. And uh, we could also show that while axon initial segments in layer four of cortex are innovated by axons, they are not specifically innovated. So the axon initial segment preference that is uh, long known to be a hallmark of uh, synaptic specificity in uh, supra and infragranular layers of cortex by the so-called chandelier cells is absent in layer four, which is uh, consistent with previous reports that uh, there are no chandelier cells in layer four. So with that kind of um, analysis, again, uh, we did not label any neurons here. We did not look at morphology. We did not look at physiology, obviously. All we did was look at the innovation properties of uh, densely packed axons in a piece of neuropil and were able to pull out the known um, cell types of inhibitory neurons. And then um, following up on that could then determine also the co-preferences between these uh, cell types quantitatively. And just to give one example, you can see there is that um, uh, quantitatively speaking, the level of preference of inhibitory nerve cells to re-innovate, for instance, a cell body is um, on the scale of 20 to 25 percent. So this is the level of preference that is established. Um, if you include proximal dendrites, that this goes up to about two thirds of the synapses of axons being placed on these preferential targets in that case. And then um, uh, this is uh, yeah, different from other groups of inhibitory axons that prefer the distal dendrite innovation. And, and again, quantitatively, this is something that uh, comes out here. Um, from that kind of data. Now, the reason I'm bringing this up and as one first, uh, if you want, you know, very uh, simple kind of analysis is because there is so much debate about how to define cell types in cortex. My view is that uh, it could be that we'll be using innovation data more and more as it becomes available to answer some of these questions, because at least from my point of view, one could argue that if you had the full connectomic profile, so to say, of all inhibitory, for instance, nerve cells, then in my view, that would provide a very um, uh, reasonable readout of cell types simply by the question of disjunct or at least uh, uh, non-common innovation properties. I want to uh, come to the next analysis also reasonably briefly, um, which again relates to a lot of literature and a lot of questions about how cortex is wired up, um, simply put. So the very simple question is, if you were to know everything about geometry, so here we are now turning to geometry and, and morphology, where we're um, using the combination of morphology and synaptic innovation for this question. So if we were to know enough about uh, the geometry of neuronal wires, of axons and dendrites and so on, would we essentially be able to predict synaptic connectivity? And this is such an important question because uh, it has been one key hypothesis for many decades that uh, while maybe in the periphery and in, in you know, certain specialized species, you may have very precise uh, neuronal circuits, but the notion was maybe cortex, our large um, processing uh, unit, so to say, on, uh, at the outside of our brains under the skull, may essentially be a, a randomly wired network that then makes use of the many things you can do with randomly wired networks. And of course, there's a lot of great theory about, or great work about how you can use randomly wired networks to compute quite interesting things. Um, but that is, of course, partly an experimental question, whether that is something that brains, as we are studying them, as have evolved, um, are made up of randomly wired networks in the cortex or not. And um, this has been coined a, a proposal of Peter's rule, 
don't want to go into um, too much detail at this point, but uh, the simple question is how much of synaptic innervation can we predict from geometrical information? And this we looked at uh, in more detail first at the level of, um, again, this notion of Peter's rule in which you would essentially say, okay, um, if I were to know in this piece of tissue how many thalamocortical axons, how many cortical axons, how many inhibitory axons um, pass through, and then I were to also know um, the contribution of different types of postsynaptic targets, uh, especially apical dendrites, smooth dendrites belonging to interneurons, uh, proximal dendrites as simple categories, what amount of the actual synaptic innovation which we measured would I be able to predict? And this we uh, now were able to calibrate essentially um, for the first time in a particular piece of tissue. So this is not simulated, but measured uh, network. And we, because we had all the data there, we could ask how much does the, pre the, the you know, fractional presence, so to say, of certain types of neurites predict the innovation that uh, we actually measured. So the first thing we asked, if we were to take uh, one version of what you call Peter's rule in which um, you're taking the view of an axon and you're essentially saying, okay, I'm an axon, I'm entering a piece of nerve tissue and now I'm gonna innovate the postsynaptic structures present based on their fractional um, prevalence, so to say. So if, you know, if half of what I'm seeing, let's say, is uh, our apical dendrites, I'll place half of my synapses on apical dendrites and, and so on. And so what you're seeing here now in this matrix uh, form is essentially a report of uh, over or under estimation of these innovations by that approach of predicting uh, circuitry. And in the case of taking the view of the axon and innovating postsynaptic structures by their relative prev uh, prevalence, we're seeing that for apical dendrites and actually a large part of other dendrites, um, prediction is reasonable, but as been shown before, the innovation of inhibitory neurons uh, is very badly predicted by many factors uh, of, so about two to fourfold um, uh, underestimated, but also uh, the thalamocortical innovation uh, preference for proximal dendrites is not captured and inhibitory innovation is also not well captured. If you compare that to the view where you turn around the prediction and you're not looking at what the axon sees, so to say, but you're asking if I were a dendrite and were to sample um, uh, uh, my, my presynaptic axons, how would that look? And uh, I'm just, yeah, so this is the, the view from the view of the dendrite. So if, if you were to uh, turn the argument around and uh, ask um, what's the fractional innovation um, uh, that a dendrite receives given the presence of axons, then things overall look pretty good. So uh, very interesting, the smooth dendrite innovation is sampling the presynaptic uh, population reasonably um, well to, uh, to the Peter's prediction. But then again, you're now losing predictive power again for the thalamocortical innovation, actually for a large fraction of the thalamocortical innovation and other inhibitory innovation. But by comparison, this is the best prediction we can get. If we take the product of path length fractions, so not, not take a pre or post synaptic view, but simply multiply the, uh, the two, what has been uh, termed innovation uh, probability before, um, then again, you're pretty much off in many of the uh, combinations. And then just to complete the picture, if you take synapse fractions instead of path length fractions. So if you were to know the synapse densities, which are different on certain axons and dendrites, um, then again, the prediction gets a little bit better, but uh, you're still making uh, quite some mistakes. So the point here is that um, with this kind of uh, geometric, if you want um, prediction, you'll have some things right. And depending on what you want to study, this may be sufficient for some questions, but there are always things that you don't get right. And because you don't have the calibration that we had here, um, we think this uh, is a clear um, support uh, to say, let's be very careful about these random assumptions and uh, for sure, and there's something I'm not gonna go into too much detail here, here but it's also in that, in that paper. Um, uh, if you take the single axon and its trajectory and ask who's around, um, your predictive power really goes down and you cannot really say anything about innovation. Now, um, this notion of uh, cortex is not random at this description level. Um, you could say, okay, fine, that's, uh, you, you accept that. Now, I wanna share briefly a, a brief detour into a study that we did a few years back, um, uh, which 
related to a different type of cortex, the so-called interrhinal cortex, mediterranean cortex. But I just want to point out one particular finding that surprised us very much there. So when we reconstructed nerve cells in that kind of tissue and their axons, um, we found, and that's a study again published a few years back in, in Nature, where we um, reconstructed all of the nerve cells, uh, dendrites in that piece of tissue, but then focused on, on a few um, uh, uh, larger axons um, and found that actually along the output, uh, along the axon of these excitatory nerve cells, um, synapses were placed in a sorted uh, manner in the sense that uh, when you come from the soma and you follow the axon and you ask, where are my synapses going? Then you will first see an innovation of inhibitory interneurons and only later excitatory nerve cells will be innovated. So this is a um, level of uh, precision that uh, was very much surprising for us in the mammalian cortex. So uh, these notions of placement and sorting and so on of synapses in other species, um, uh, in particular, for instance, for, for um, timing uh, of, of auditory processing in birds and uh, other things had been out there for, for or known for many decades, actually. But uh, that the cerebral cortex of mammals in which um, again, random wiring is still assumed by many, uh, is using synapse placement on axons, on the path length of axons, to select uh, innovation targets um, it's in the dense network, in the dense no local net network, not long, you know, long projections. In the dense local network was something that surprised us very much and uh, was a very consistent finding that uh, got enhanced over age and um, it gives rise to a circuitry in which you can uh, enable inhibitory interactions to be so fast as to overtake excitatory um, transmission. And I just want to briefly show this interpretation here. So essentially what this uh, kind of setup does is that you can innovate inhibitory neurons so effectively because you're placing your synapses along your cable first and obviously, if you have a traveling signal like an action potential down the axon, then whoever gets targeted first has a chance to be um, excited first. And this is what's happening here. We think that interneurons get activated first and then um, uh, excitatory neurons get activated later. So that means the inhibitory neuron has the chance to overtake inhibition, uh, to overtake excitation, uh, which is shown here on the left in what we call cellular level feed forward inhibition. So in other words, these interneurons that are targeted first uh, immediately make synapses onto the very same postsynaptic targets that the excitatory neuron is innovating. And these triads of, of innovation um, quantitatively can be so effective that, uh, that essentially the postsynaptic excitatory neuron cannot receive or cannot fire an action potential um, uh, in time. Have you have you calculated whether the conductance delays and the conductance speed match your intuition here? Yeah, exactly. So let me jump to that. I'll just bri briefly mention one additional fact before I'm doing exactly what you're asking for. Um, so another big surprise was that when we looked at something as, uh, you, if you want, simple, biophysically simple as, as axon diameters, then uh, we found that the interneuron axons are about th three times thicker than wider than the excitatory neurons in that particular circuit and myelinated. So myelination is uh, focused in that tissue a lot on those interneurons. The axons are almost 100% myelinated before they make synapses and are about three times wider than the very thin excitatory axons. And um, anyone in, interested in these kinds of biophysics knows that wider axons are faster plus myelinated. So, so this again enhances the possibility for inhibition to be much faster. Um, there are other aspects of the circuit I'm not gonna go into detail about, but now to the question that Tim just um, raised, is that quantitatively plausible? Well, um, it is. So the, the offset, the, the spatial offset of these synapse placements is on the scale of 100 to 150 micrometers in this, uh, in this particular circuit. And um, if you now, take, uh, let's say, a synchronous uh, activation in the presynaptic population and then play all these uh, parameters in, then what we find is that, in fact, without synapse sorting, you have no chance of overtaking excitation, of course, right? Because you need to always fire an action potential in the interneuron, and this just takes time, and that's too late to overcome postsynaptic excitation. But if you do insert this uh, additional offset, timing offset, 
And here quantitatively, what we mean by that is if you allow the synapse placement to add a delay of half, half a millisecond, then together with very fast inhibitory transmission, which has been shown to be there, where the um, latency in the inhibitory branch is only on the scale of half a millisecond um, uh, for, for um, AP to IPSP onset, then you are in a range where you can su fully suppress postsynaptic action potential formation. And uh, is this conduction time um, plausible? Well, with a 120 micron uh, micrometers offset, uh, half a millisecond, uh, or let's say if, if you if you had uh, 120 or so uh, uh, milliseconds per, per uh, micron speed, then you would end up with a millisecond. If you have 240, you would be at about 0.5. So I think this is, uh, and this, these are values that are not unreasonable. So um, with these very thin axons, remember that these excitatory axons are almost as if they were made to be small. It's of course our interpretation, but we really stunned how thin they are. We think it's not implausible. This still has to be measured for this particular cell type. For other cell types in the cortex, it has been shown that transmission can be as slow in the excitatory uh, no. transmission on the exon. Sorry to interrupt again. Do, do, you, do you have any indication that the inhibitory neurons target the same targets as the excitatory uh, axons that they're recruiting their inputs from? Yes, so that's what uh, we, uh, I showed briefly earlier, but I browsed over it pretty fast. Yeah, so that's exactly what we found, that the, the, there is a, an extreme, almost 100% match between, uh, if you, uh, between the excitatory targets of the excitatory neurons and the inhibitory, or the excitatory targets of the inhibitory neurons activated by that circuit. It's almost, I mean, my, especially given that we are not, we cannot reconstruct all connections, we're seeing it in almost all connections. So, so it's a very high abundance of that. Thank you. Okay, so um, the bigger point here I want to make beyond, I mean, I'm fascinated by this biophysical precision here, but the bigger point is exactly that level of precision. So we're, we're seeing that um, not only can we, you know, say, uh, you know, simple Peter style random wiring predictions are probably not uh, true. Um, what's even more stunning is that, that we have to be aware of potential um, mechanisms that involve micron precise or at least 100 micrometer precise synapse placements in the postsynaptic axon. So we're not talking about the dendrite there. These um, uh, concepts have been discussed for quite a while, but but really along the output uh, along the output axon. It's a it's a level of precision that we find in the, in the cerebral cortex that uh, we found uh, reasonably stunning. I'm going to gloss over this, just uh, again, uh, show this triadic configuration of in innovation. We see uh, whenever an excitatory neuron talks to another excitatory neuron, there's an interneuron in the loop. You could interpret this essentially as a compensation for what's been called Dale's law. So the fact that in mammalian brains, but by the way, not in uh, all species, of course, right? But but in mammalian brains, um, inhibition is is focused on or is given, so to say, or is ex expressed by a separate cell type, right? Interneurons. Um, that of course implies that you need an additional action potential to get inhibitory transmission. And we would argue that what we found here could um, allow you to compensate for that disadvantage, so to say, of inhibition, of always being one synapse late. Um, and that's, of course, something that we think is um, interesting to think about, um, especially because if you have such a blocked transmission channel, then you want to unblock it under certain circumstances. And we think that by disinhibition and or additional switch input, so to say, or excitatory input, you could then unlock certain uh, hypotheses if there's data for for, uh, for it to be true. So it's one possible way of thinking about this is that these are essentially predictive, hardwired predictive circuits that, that are silent. And because you could parallelize that massively, especially if they're silent, they're also very energy efficient. And then you can essentially uh, um, imprint a lot of uh, possibilities uh, and only um, use activity to unlock them, so to say, when there is context. All right, so I'm, um, yeah. I was trying to, to make this a point about precision of a circuitry here. And um, I will now switch to my last point, um, if uh, time permits. So I have a couple of minutes left, I think, Tim. So can I, can I add one additional analysis? Of course, of course. That'd be lovely. So um, I would like to talk about plasticity. And this is, of course, uh, um, maybe a little bit unintuitive, uh, 
to take a static snapshot of a circuit and try to talk about plasticity. But um, we think that there are good reasons to do so. And uh, essentially the question is, if we take a snapshot of a neuronal circuit, in this case at four weeks of age of a mouse, um, can we ask or can we learn about how much plastic events can have taken place uh, before? And the notion that we're going to be using here is, uh, first of all, as you all know, the concepts of um, strengthening and weakening of synapses based on electrical activity of pre and post synaptic nerve cells. And the key point here is that um, it's, been, it's been shown quite uh, extensively for excitatory synapses, not for inhibitory, but for excitatory synapses, that the size of, of synapses, the, the volume of the spine, the volume of the bouton, but also the postsynaptic density area or other measures very well correlate with the strength of the synapse. So we're now turning to an analysis where we care about um, not just the binary existence or non-existence of a synapse, like I showed it in the uh, initial connectome, but about the weights of the synapses in the connectome. And again, there are beautiful studies, many of them actually, uh, some of them I, I put out here, um, showing direct correlation between the synaptic area of excitatory synapses, and in this case, the receptor density, or not density, the number of receptors postsynaptically, um, uh, which would also then again correlate strongly with the strength of the synapse. Now, um, as you know, concepts about LTP and LTD, uh, synapse specific concepts where um, enlargement or strengthening of synapses depends on pre uh, and post synaptic activity have been studied extensively. And here we are going to uh, use a concept that um, relates to pairs of synapses. So um, as we know, most nerve cells, when they interact with other nerve cells, um, in the cortex at least, establish more than one synapse. Actually in the periphery, it's even many more. So in the retina, for instance, it's typically several dozens of synapses made between a pair of neurons when they interact. Um, in the cortex, uh, based on uh, work from paired recordings uh, from the last decades, we know that this number is rather two, three, four, five synapses per cell pair um, that are established. So therefore, um, in such a dense reconstruction like the one we did, we have many, many instances of, of uh, axons making more than one synapse with the very same postsynaptic dendrite. And an example is shown here. Um, and this allows you to now uh, ask about a particular model of um, plasticity. And this is the one that's termed Hebbian plasticity, where the timing or the, the activity of the presynaptic axon together with electrical activity in the postsynaptic dendrite, if close enough temporally, um, would be predicted to yield an enhancement of the weight of the synapse or strengthening of the synapse. And now the argument is that since if you have two synapses, at least let's say of the same pre and postsynaptic neuride, then this timing would be reasonably similar between those two synapses. So you would have uh, presynaptic activity and postsynaptic activity, at least in many cases, reasonably well um, linked to each other. So the argument would be if you have happy and plasticity working at these two synapses, then um, they should either grow together or uh, decline together. And this notion, um, depending on whether you also consider uh, you know, this in a, a symmetric or at least uh, in both directions of potentiation and depression, this notion then leads to a very simple prediction, which is that over time, if you have similar activity um, in, at these two synapses and this activity gives rise to LTP, then your strength of the synapses should um, get more and more similar. And this is even just arithmetically true on the right side. If you simply increase the weight over time, or if you simply increase the weight, then the relative difference between those two synaptic weights will decrease. But it's of course especially true if you have a saturation of synaptic weight, which is a plausible assumption in biological systems, um, where of course then uh, similarity would even further enhance. So in other words, um, relative similarity of synaptic weight is a direct prediction of heavy and LTP in pairs of synapses. So if you plot this in, uh, in a way like shown here, where on the X axis, um, we're reporting the relative difference of a synaptic pair and on the y-axis the relative weight or the absolute weight of this uh, synaptic pair. 
Then LTP is predicted to move synapse pairs, uh, which are shown here as dots and lines, synapse pairs essentially from anywhere they start up to the um, upper left part of this plot. Um, again, a direct prediction from what we said about um, same timing yielding a more similarity and larger synaptic weights. And you could make the same argument even for LTD. It's a little bit more complicated because it depends on whether you're, uh, you know, getting rid of your weak synapses or not. But if you're not, if you're, if you're saturating um, or converging on a low weight, uh, then you would also have a prediction here that those synapses would end up in the bottom left part of this plot, so to say. So um, on average, small and uh, similar. Now, these particular predictions, we were then able to, of course, uh, use our data to ask whether um, we could find any signs of such uh, learning. And uh, so the important point is, this is not just about whether we find any signs of this, uh, of such processes, but here for the first time, we were able to quantify what fraction of the circuit would likely undergo or have undergone such processes. So this is really the, the novelty here in our view, because we have thousands of these uh, cases, um, we were able to ask about the prevalence of evidence for learning, so to say. A particular form of learning, Hebbian, so this is, uh, was the model that we used uh, at the time, uh, but uh, quite uh, important one, uh, we think. So what we did, we then essentially compared our distribution of synaptic weight in these pairs of synapses to a random shuffling of the same data. So what you're seeing here on the left is our measured data, the distribution of weight and weight similarity in pairs of synapses subtracted by a random reshuffling of these synaptic weights. So essentially, all, the only thing we changed was the assignment of the weights to the particular axons and dendrites. And then the difference, as shown on the right, um, would now be an indication of, of which uh, constellation, so to say, of synapse weight is more prevalent than expected. And um, in fact, what we found, as you can see on the right, is that there was an overabundance of large and similar uh, synapse pairs and also uh, one of lower, uh, smaller, and similar synapse pairs at the expense of um, dissimilar average-sized synapses. So in other words, um, the direct prediction made from Hebbian learning, which is there should be more similar large weights, um, is something we find in the data. And then you can quantitatively ask, in these regions that are significantly overabundant, so to say, um, how many synapse pairs reside in these regions or contribute to this? And uh, that would then, in our view, be at least one measure of how much uh, plasticity can have uh, happened in this kind of circuit. And here the numbers were on the scale of 20% for enhancement, 20% for uh, reduction. So in a at least simple way, one could say up to 40% of uh, plastic um, circuit contribution with several assumptions, so don't get me wrong, you, many things we can discuss about this, but I think this basic notion of saying, okay, I have, a, I have a model about learning, I know what could happen, and then I'm asking in the connectome, what fraction of the circuit shows signs of this kind of learning or, or contributes evidence for such processes. Uh, I think this is, a, in my view, important approach because it allows us to take these static circuit snapshots to ask something about plausible um, variation or plasticity of these circuits in the past. And again, this was the, the new thing to ask about the fractional change that in the, such a circuit that, that could be contributed by plasticity. Not the fact that you have such a phenomena, but the question how much of the circuit can have been formed by these kinds of plastic events. And we did you know, more detailed analysis, obviously, about thalamocortical connections and others. I'm not going to go into this detail at this point, unless you want. Um, so uh, this is the basic notion here. So signs of plasticity in the connectome, yes, we do think we find those and uh, we can quantify, this is the important point, we can quantify the fraction of the circuit that uh, is shaped by or can be shaped by these processes or more precisely is consistent with Hebbian learning. Um, and this is particularly interesting in this circuit where it's known that there's a critical period in the first week of that animal's life uh, for S1 synapses um, uh, and the, in these thalamocortical connections, and this would then essentially allow us to say that up to 15% of the thalamocortical connections four weeks later are still stable and everything to the point that they are consistent with LTP um, having happened in this case three weeks ago.
All right, so to summarize, we densely mapped and uh, analyzed uh, the connectivity in a piece of cortex about 100 micron on the side. Um, visualized here again, we are flying through the blood vessels now that are taken out, all sign uh, things are synapses. And then we use that for several analyses about the precision and uh, predictability of circuitry, but in particular one where we use this to read out the fraction of the circuit that uh, is consistent with learning, previous learning in that animal's life here in orange now shown all the synapses that are consistent with having been exposed to heavy plasticity and all other synapses are at least not consistent uh, unless you assume other processes that might destroy this uh, pairwise synapse relationship uh, that is predicted by heavy learning. All right. Um, so I talked about the reconstructions um, with all the uh, improvements that made them possible, but then talked about uh, cell type definition based on conicomic data, uh, the analysis of geometric predictability. Um, and then uh, I talked about this last point, the, the possibility to extract the fractional um, plastic circuit, so to say, or even the learnedness, the degree of learning having or being plausible with the connectome that we measure it. And that's obviously something that we'd be very interested in measuring in other circumstances to compare this um, uh, to other settings. Now, in the interest of time, I will um, jump to, uh, yeah, I'll skip one thing that I wanted to, or would have been, you know, talked about in terms of connectomic analysis for distinguishing computational models, but I'm not really? gonna do that right now. I'm gonna jump to the end to, um, show you briefly where this is all going, and then I'd be happy to pick up to the topics in the discussion, okay. uh, um, if that's okay. Um, so I'm um, just experimentally speaking. So the the key goal, of course, is to go to much larger volumes, and um, this, in our hands, is helped enormously by a microscope developed by Zeiss called the Multi Beam Scanning Electron Microscope, which is a microscope that has not one does not have one scanning electron beam, but 61. And by using that, we can image much, much faster, uh, much higher throughput to the point of getting to volumes that we think are really interesting in terms of analyzing cortical circuits at scale and um, uh, to just jump to the kind of data we're acquiring. So here you're now seeing a 3DEM data set acquired from S1, again, primary somewhat sensory cortex of mouse, but this time spanning all layers from the top, uh, which is PIA, so the surface of the brain on the, on the top on the left, and then all through all six layers of cortex down to the white matter, which is shown in more black structures on the bottom because of the myelinated axons. So this is now really the entire depth of a piece of cortex from S1, cortex in mouse, um, including many reasonably complete local circuits, in particular the ones in layer four where we have these so-called barrels, so units of processing comprising a few thousand nerve cells. And this is now for us a beautiful playground to um, go one step further. So from the locally dense reconstruction of each and every axon that enters a volume to what uh, Tim was referring to earlier, which is the locally dense reconstruction of the neuron to neuron connectivity with the neurons and their cell bodies uh, in the piece of tissue. So um, something that, that we've been striving for for a long time. And now obviously we're working hard on, on getting that um, done um, just in terms of uh, image data, again, to show a little bit of EM. Um, electromicroscopic views of the brain. If you zoom in here, um, you'll again be able to uh, embrace and admire, I think, at least the beauty of uh, mammalian um, cortical circuitry. So here now at the level of even single vesicles, which is not our key interest, but again, high resolution, you can follow all the thin axons and dendritic spines and everything and uh, at the alignment and data quality level that uh, allows us to automate this reconstruction um, extremely well, um, study the circuitry in these so-called barrels and, and in the cortical column, um, and uh, use that to uh, ask questions about circuit structure and cortex at that scale. And here's just a nice visualization of all the uh, neurons in the cortical column um, reconstructed, in this case, uh, fully automatically. Obviously, there's still some work to do, but um, this is uh, just a glimpse at where this is all going. 
All right. So um, with that, I want to thank all the people involved. Many uh, people contributed, obviously, to these uh, various projects for the dense uh, layer four reconstruction that I talked most about. This was uh, the main contributions were from Alessandro Motta, Manuel Berning, Kevin Bergens, and Benedict Stafter. Um, I talked about uh, exonal sign-up sorting work done by Helene Schmidt in collaboration with Michael Brecht there. Um, and the final few slides uh, were data um, acquired and uh, analyzed um, by um, uh, Maike and Martin and others. And uh, there are, of course, many students um, also helping with all this work. Anyway, so with that, thanks a lot for your attention so far. I've a little bit uh, pushed the time, but um, I hope some of you stayed with us uh, again. I'm sorry for being talking to a screen. I hope I was still able to convey some of the excitement we have with this kind of work. Um, thanks for your patience and I'm very happy to discuss further. Thank you, Moritz. Absolutely no apologies necessary. I think um, it was quite an amazing talk and it's really fascinating to me to see how much you can pull out of your connectome data. Um, there is a question uh, from the audience that I'll read to you uh, from Sean. Uh, that so I'm, I'm stopping screen sharing right now, right? So yeah. that's probably okay. the best. Do that now. Um, yeah. Sean is asking, a recent paper at Nature Molecular Psychiatry from the Bayer Lab at MIT showed that in my hippocampus, they did not observe spine shrinkage of MGLUR-based LTD. Their claim is that functional and structural plasticity do not always correlate. Will this challenge the underlying assumptions EM connectomics of your science paper needs to infer plasticity rules from fixed tissue? Thanks for the talk. Yeah, so obviously, I mean, I think I laid out the assumptions and there has been quite some um, great work by many labs over the decades showing um, in many ways how for a given signups, uh, when that's possible, you can correlate size with, for instance, uh, receptor number postsynaptically, and then also in some rare cases, or in some cases, directly correlate that to strength. There's more recent work um, uh, on, on bioarchive from Kevin Martin's lab, directly correlating paired recordings with uh, synapse size measures and so on. So I think there is very good support of that, but of course, if you were to describe a process in which nothing changes, nothing visible, so to say, changes. So size of synapse stays the same, receptor number stays the same, everything's the same, but for some other reason in the complex ma machinery, um, uh, the synaptic weight, so to say, so the, the size of the postsynaptic uh, conductance change decreases, that would um, challenge the arguments at least about um, smaller synapses. For larger synapses, so I think, anyway, I think the, the data is strongest for having an LTP because, uh, I mean, for some of the reasons I mentioned, right? So if you grow together, you get larger, that uh, creates a much stronger signal. Small synapses at some point, you don't know, are they maybe also uh, deleted, so to say, are they taken away and so on. So, so that's more complex. So I think the LTP part anyway is the, is the stronger argument. Um, but I, I fully agree. I mean, obviously, if any of the assumptions uh, I laid out are not true, then then uh, that challenges the conclusions. But again, given the literature, I think a large fraction of that is reasonably stable. Um, in the same vein, did you also look at inhibitory synapses? Do inhibitory synapses do the same thing, that they have more than one uh, ax uh, synapse onto the same postsynaptic target? Um, yeah, so I mean, that's a very important question. And uh, yes, first of all, they have many uh, or several synapses. Actually, the literature would indicate that the number of synapses per target is uh, even larger potentially, although that uh, I'm not sure that holds true for all. Well, I, I'm sure it doesn't hold true for all types of interneurons, but for some. Um, the problem there is that, uh, I mean, uh, we just heard one a caveat even about excitatory synapses, which are placed on spines mostly, which are very clear structures where this correlation has been worked out uh, very, very well. So with inhibitory synapses, to my knowledge, this data is not, doesn't exist. So we don't know, uh, we, we don't have any calibration, or at least to my knowledge, no, no at least not, not even comparable to what we have for excitatory synapses. Mm -hmm. So, and actually I have to say, most of the synapses of inhibitory neurons are placed on shafts. So not on spines, but on, on the shaft of the dendrites. And even just morphologically, just looking at that, we are much more careful there. So we feel 
I mean, this really has to be worked out, whether there's a relationship between size and strength for shaft synapses. Yeah. Um, I, I'd be, yeah, I think we need data for that. We don't in, in the same direction, uh, when you were speaking about these motifs where, uh, you know, the axon uh, first uh, or first in the temporal order activates an inhibitory neuron and then activates excitatory neurons uh, that are at the same time targets of the inhibition, um, do you find or do you have any indication as to the dendritic placements of the inhibitory uh, synapses? Are they finding the same dendritic locations as the excitatory uh, synapses? Or yeah, so that's that's very, I mean, there actually we, we, we were able to uh, pull that apart pretty um, uh, well. So the so yes, they are, so first of all, what we saw was they were placed more proximally. This is in general true, but in, in this particular triad, so the very synapses from those interneurons were more proximal postsynaptically on the excitatory cell than the excitatory inputs. They were also twofold more numerous. Now, at the single dendrite level, which you're asking for, we actually did not do that analysis. My, my recollection from that data is that it was, I mean, some were on the same primary dendrites, but not all. Um, but this is a very interesting question. But And just a brief comment on that, because in the other branch, in the one where the excitatory neurons excite the interneuron, there we saw massive synaptic clustering on the dendrite to the point of having 10 synapses placed within, you know, 40 microns or so on. The, so massive local clustering of innovation from excitatory to inhibitory, again, along the line of making the inhibition strong. Presumably to have just a few action potentials that are enough to depolarize the inhibitory neurons enough to send inhibitory signals or That signals. is my uh, interpretation, yeah. Mm -hmm. um, so you were just mentioning the inhibitory synapses that you observed were all axosomatic, so onto the soma, uh, indicating that these are all or more likely PD positive than some positive interneurons, or can you say anything about the types so, of... Are, are you referring to the to the um, data about the synapse sorting or the dense about, about the About these motifs, you mm -hmm. were just saying in your answer that the motifs that ah. you were seeing, mm -hmm. uh, the inhibitory synapses were often yeah. more likely to be found on the soma. Yeah. So in that case, so for that particular motif, we in fact think we're looking at uh, some sort of basket cell. We did not do any molecular staining, but morphologically speaking, so multiple dendritic trees and the placement of synapses to the soma and or proximal dendrites makes that very plausible. So small, we, we would call them small, if, I mean, you could call them small basket cells, I think, um, and they would usually be palatable positive. Okay. Uh, I have a question from the audience. Uh, he says, I see connectomics as genomics will have a reference connectome for different species the way we have a genome reference. In this endeavor, I'm guessing data analysis is the limiting factor. How far are we from having a complete reference connectome? Yeah, so the um, this is really a question that's very uh, much dependent on the species of, of interest. So, um, as many of you will know, we have the historical um, endeavor from the worms, the elegance, where Sidney Brenner and colleagues, and then uh, with contributions from Mitchell lab recently, and uh, then other redos of other aspects of the connectome, they have essentially generated a um, full connectome, not exactly of one animal, but about, of three animals stitched together for C. elegans. So in that sense, that um, is the reference connectome for C. elegans. There is, uh, as I briefly mentioned in the beginning, a major effort uh, at Geneva Farm um, where they are very close to or have mapped uh, a large part of a fly brain, so Drosophila uh, connectome in, again, various variants and depending on imaging technique and scope and uh, extent and half a brain or a whole brain, but on that scale. So that is really impressive work, of course. And then you can guess that, of course, going to larger animals uh, goes uh, to the third power, becomes more effort because we're talking about volume here. So a mouse brain is something that uh, is um, a great ambition of the field right now, but hasn't been done. And then, of course, I would say we should also not stop before we have a human brain. Um, but this may be a, a little bit in the future. But again, I think uh, as it, with genomics, we shouldn't uh, stop uh, or we won't stop, I think, as a field definitely and even some of us won't stop before we go, go so far. Um, and then the question about one reference. I mean, I think, again, genomics can be informative there. So I think, yes, of course, the first reference genome, the human genome, for instance, was enormously important to answer some very basic uh, uh, questions and uh, 
probably saw, you know, also uh, ignite very basic confusion. But then the mapping of many genomes on the scale of thousands, tens of thousands, millions, you know, what we're talking about now with large scale screenings, even single cell screenings, variation uh, analyses, uh, um, genome wide association studies, and so on. This is the real, I think, the real uh, benefit. And um, so, yes, one reference is important, but um, I think the real fun will be having many or being so fast that you can do many. And then it doesn't mean that you always have to do the entire uh, connectome, very much like with genomics. So uh, I think that in parallel to going for reference genome, uh, connectomes, um, uh, so I, we're pushing a lot also on what we call screening approaches, where we take smaller volumes, but many, you know, across different conditions, across development, across possible pathological states and so on. Species, of course, cross species comparisons where you profit from many samples more than from one entire connectome. Yeah. Um, there was a follow-up question to your, uh, to your answer, uh, or, or it's a nice follow-up question anyway, from an independent asker. Dean Rance from South Africa is asking um, whether the, there is going to be expected scaling problems as you increase the volume of your uh, samples uh, in terms of analyzing the larger scans uh, sort of like running graphs uh, or algorithms in larger, more dense uh, graphs? So, I mean, this question, if I understand correctly, relates to analysis challenges at many uh, scales. So obviously the first one is to turn large scale image data into a graph in the first place. And uh, so what we call the connectome and, and the additional information that we were also talking about like weights and so on, so weighted graphs. But yeah. this part is currently, I would say, or still is, uh, a key challenge or the key challenge in the field. So this is what most of our analysis efforts have been invested in and uh, many uh, players in the field uh, have been working on that. And here, for instance, being able to match this uh, enhanced um, image uh, acquisition that I showed in the end with a comparable uh, enhancement in processing throughput is the key challenge to be able to analyze this. And this we've been able to do so far uh, at least, and I think this, you know, will will take some uh, major efficiency gains in analysis. So we can't, you know, just waste uh, so much processing time on each and every voxel. But uh, we have some good ideas and others too of how to do that. Um, then maybe you also were asking about the graph analysis, and because that's actually also surprisingly, I mean, not for those who work on this, like them and others, but but it's surprisingly um, uh, expensive. Right to as at least depends on what you want to do, but uh, uh, we you know so that will also be at some point a challenge if you if you in fact have a ten thousand by ten thousand connectome, uh, some analysis is also expensive at that scale. Um, two more questions I have, and then I'll let you go. Um, Number one was, do you have any indication uh, that there is more than one type of uh, excitatory synapse? So you've, you've put all excitatory or putatively excitatory synapses into the same bucket. And people have been very long for talking for a long time whether there is more than one inhibitory, uh, excitatory cell type uh, in cortex or whether we can distinguish between them. Um, and in the same realm, uh, do, you, do you have any indication that there is more than one plasticity rule acting on these excitatory synapses? So do you see a footprint of maybe an anti-Hebian rule or any other kind of rule that you could think of yeah. in your so day? For the first one, I mean, the first question you could ask, are you um, wondering about the possibility of having different types of synapses for the same excitatory cell? Or uh, are you uh, talking about different uh, cells with different synapses? So the latter, obviously, I mean, we have, for instance, in this case, thalamocortical inputs, uh, so axons coming from thalamus, they have larger synapses, they, they make multi-synaptic boutons with several spine heads around a given bouton. They are uh, wider axons, They're, so that's really di very different. And morphologically, you can tell apart the thalamocortical inputs. And similarly, already at the light uh, level, light microscopic level, we know that, for instance, the axon of a spiny stellate, so a local excitatory neuron in layer four of cortex, uh, uh, is different from uh, the excitatory axon of a pyramidal cell, which has different uh, branching patterns, but also uh, locally um, different properties. So um, yes, there. I, I'm. I mean, we know a little bit already, and there will be much more. I'm pretty sure. Um, interestingly, by the way, one thing that we're very curious about are uh, 
uh, what is called modulatory axons. So, so you know, long range inputs with even different transmitters and being able to take those, tell those apart morphologically is going to be a major advantage. But yes, so on the excited side, there will be some. Now, um, other than heavy and plasticity rules, I mean, of course, this is, I think. Uh, do you have indication of, do you have modulatory synapses already in your data set? Or are they all excitatory inhibitory right now? Well, I mean, we have re re we've reconstructed each and every exon to the point that yeah, we could. Yeah. So, so they are very rare. And we've looked into some morphological descriptions. So we think some of them with, for instance, very few boutons, very straight and so on. So there are some things that we know could be the signature of certain um, long range uh, modulatory inputs. We're working or we've developed a method to correlate fluorescent uh, imaging to our dense reconstructions and this we are using to look at this in more detail. So uh, I think that's something of course I have to find out about. Um, if I may briefly about the non non Habian uh, learning. So I think I, I fully agree this is very interesting and to me this is also a point I wanted to make not so much that the I mean we looked at Habian predictions so to say but this general notion that if you have a if, if you have a rule a plasticity rule or other um, rules that change synaptic weight. And uh, if those make distinctive predictions compared to another hypothesis one may have, then, then this is what connectomics may be able to deliver with the caveats mentioned, of course, to, to then say, okay, look, do I have evidence for these processes uh, as long as my predictions are reasonably plausible? So for instance, non habian if you were thinking, for instance, about homeostatic plasticity, I can think that through. So uh, saying that local or predicting that local um, neighborhood of spines in that case would induce, for instance, some re-scaling um, of the weights in neighboring synapses. So in other words, if one synapse goes up in weight, would the neighboring synapses uh, decrease in weight? So that again makes a clear prediction, which is that if you take the spatial relationship between synapses, you should see these weight distributions, which in this particular case we actually did not uh, see um, for layer four cells at least. So these are examples. And I think, again, as long as you can make clear predictions, and I think many models can, then this is, I think, a very exciting um, way of testing them. Moritz, last question from the audience, and maybe a good closing question. How far are we from connecting behavior to functional and structural uh, data, EM data? How far? I mean, again, it depends on, um, on the species one is interested in. So in, in other words, I think, I mean, for flies, given the progress of, uh, of the people in the field who've been working on fly connectomes, um, I think it's not implausible to take a mutant fly that may be behaving differently and doing another connectome. I mean, and I don't want to diminish the effort here in this description, but just to be optimistic. I mean, I think that is not, doesn't sound totally implausible to me. Doing the same for a mouse, full mouse connectome, let's first do the first mouse connectome. But yes, why not? I mean, again, I think that, uh, the local sampling shouldn't be underestimated because when we say local, as I showed, I mean, if you can take chunks of cortex and get the entire connectivity uh, in the future, at least at reasonable pace, then screening that against behavioral uh, uh, variation, genetic variation um, w will be plausible. And I think this, I mean, I have to say, this is one of my uh, dreams for the far future, right? To have a, have a um, genomic, connectomic, behavioral, correlation. Ideally in a genetically, it's, you know, normally heterogeneous, not, not even manipulated population, right? So just take, uh, take a population with the normal quote unquote genetic variation and then ask what's the genome, connectome, phenotypes of the cells, the behavioral um, correlation that I think would be pretty interesting. Do you want to dare to put a year on it? Oh, I always love these questions because this is in science. That's the great thing about this being a scientist. So first of all, all of you know that any answer I'm giving, you have to multiply by at least a factor of two, five or 10. And then, and then uh, obviously we have absolutely no accountability. How should we, right? I mean, we are scientists, we're doing new stuff. So who knows? Um, but I'm optimistic, obviously, you know, the, the optimism will turn into realism at some point. But uh, of course, uh, I hope that we will, I mean, we've been seeing, let's put it like that. So we've been seeing enormous progress in those last 20 years that we've been working on this, essentially, or 15 to 20 years that we've been working on this in the field, um, many orders of magnitude. I mean, I could try to put a number to it, even so three to four, depending on how you frame it. So we want to even get faster, but even if we are just able to get another four to five orders of magnitude in the next uh, 10 to 15 years, that would be amazing. And then we would be talking about all of this. Hmm. All right. 
Cool. Thank you very much, Moritz. With that, I'll uh, I'll let you go. Uh, I'll see you on the other side in a Zoom room. Uh, but thank you very much again for your time and for answering all these questions. So My please. great pleasure and very grateful for all your interest and your great questions. So take care in right. these crazy times. Be safe. Yeah. Thank you. You too.